So James 5, I want to look at verses 19 to 20. Kind of like last week. I mean, this is something I am studying myself because it's just a reality. I'm thinking about these truths that are found here. So let's read verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's read it one more time. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that You would quicken this Word. Lord, quicken this Word tonight to our hearts and just meet with us, Lord. Uh, fill us with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, give me clarity as I seek to teach the sheep. And Lord, what, what, a, what a big truth here for sheep to get. Lord, that we would be those who go after the wanderers, uh, that we would bring them back. And so Lord, would You just uh, give us some light tonight. Give us fellowship with You. Lord, just draw near to us. Lord, that's our great desire is Your presence uh, to be here among us. And so Lord, please be kind to our defenseless heads. Just ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I'm just calling this kind of what the text is talking about. Go after the wanderers. Those who wander. Now, he starts verse 19 saying what? My brothers. So it's pretty obvious. He's talking to Christians, professing Christians. And his main, his main thing here, he's not talking to those who are wondering. And I don't know if we have anyone here who's wondering tonight, but James is not addressing those people. His specific thing is to those who are not wondering. We see that. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him, the person who brings him back, know. So there's something we need to know who are to bring people back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now first observation, fairly simple. He, he writes in a way where he gives us a heads up this is going to happen in the future. I mean, James just writes like that. I mean, he's just kind of, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, it's like, wait a minute. If anyone wanders from the truth, he just says it like, it's going to happen. People are going to wander from the truth. He just says it like that. So we shouldn't be surprised when it happens. And that was, you know, at the top of my notes, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five names of five people that I've been close with who have wandered from the truth. And as I was studying this, I had their five names on my notes to think about them. Because I was thinking, they've wandered from the truth. One thing I had to think about is, am I doing what I can to bring them back? Because that's what the text calls me to do. And, you know, uh, uh, one individual I was convicted, I hadn't done anything for a month and a half, and so I tried to call him. He didn't pick up my call. He lives in another state. But I realized I need to try to bring this person back. And that's also an encouragement here. He not just says naturally, if anyone among you wonders from the truth, kind of like this is going to happen, don't be shocked. But then he follows up by saying, and someone brings him back. He just kind of assumes that's happening in church life. In the life of the church, you've got people wandering from the truth, and then we've got people going and bringing them back. So that's, that's encouraging to me. The way James writes, I shouldn't be surprised when people wander from the truth. And I should expect that people will be able to bring people back to the truth. We should expect that to happen. Now this exhortation is in other places. Don't turn there, but Galatians 6.1 Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Jude one twenty eight. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. 
So as Christians, the Bible looks at us as firefighters, you could say. There are people who are in a fire. There are people who are wondering. Not just firefighters. The Bible puts the burden on all believers, not just the pastors. That all of us believers, I mean, we're, we're kind of like that ranger where someone has wandered away from the trail in Yosemite Park and they're totally lost. And the Bible puts on us that we are uh, like a ranger. We're called to bring them back to the truth. Back to the path. And if you notice in verse 19 here in James 5, he says, my brothers. So again, he's not saying my pastors. He's saying my brothers. So you guys, none of us can escape from this verse. We're in James 5, 19 and 20. So, we see this exhortation. Yeah, Galatians 6, Jude 1. It's there. It's places in the Scripture. Now, he says right here, my brothers, if anyone among you wonders, wonders from the truth. Let's think about that word, wonders. In some versions, it's read, led astray. When you think about wandering, I mean, it is, it is kind of the person. They're on the path, and then they kind of, you know, they see kind of some bushes opening up, and they think, hey, there's another path. And they get led astray. There's no sign, and they just kind of go, and then they can't get back to the one path. To, be one, to wander away means to be misled. I mean, has anyone ever been misled before? I know uh, once we had the men's retreat, and this is Scott Haney's dad's ranch. Well, people were putting the address in their GPSs, but their GPSs were bringing them to the neighbor's house. And I mean, that guy got so mad, he was coming out. He kept seeing all these cars pull up to his house, and he was incredibly furious. And he got out and, from what I remember, chewed out one of the cars. What are you guys doing? Well, they were misled by a GPS. The GPS probably wasn't at fault. It was... Um, you know, the maps the GPS was getting. But they were misled. They were deceived by the GPS. It said, go this way, and they're actually supposed to go that way. So when we think about wondering, that's what we're thinking about. I even thought of a recent church email. Uh, a, a dear sister in another church, she sent an email out, and she said this, please pray for my dad. He went for a four to five hour or a walk four to five hours ago in his bathrobe and has not come back. My parents live in the hills outside of Abilene. He is in the early stages of dementia. And you know what happens in dementia? You have bad reasoning and bad judgment. And they were afraid this was going to happen. And he wandered away. For four or five hours, they couldn't find him. He has balancing problems. And later we heard in an email that someone went out and brought him back. He wandered and someone brought him back. When he was found by a police search dog, he was, he was very dehydrated, had cuts and scrapes. He tried to crawl to get help or to get to shade, but could only go a couple of inches at a time. So if you remember, that was in the church emails. That made me think about someone who wanders. This person had impaired reasoning and judgment and it led them to wander and they got lost. He says right here, they did not come back. And we see that in the church. We see people wonder from the truth, not the church, but the truth, and they don't come back. And guess what they did with her dad? They sent out search dogs and they found him. Are we doing that? When I see someone wonder from the truth, am I, am I calling the, the, the police, so to speak? Am I calling the brethren in the church to go after them, to bring them back? So he was found. He was brought back. Okay, let's go on. He says right here, James 5.19, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. So let's think about that for a moment. If anyone among you, meaning these people who wander were among us. They are professors of religion. They are people who are saying they're Christians. They're people who are coming into the context of the church. They are among us. This is not a lost person like you guys were trying to evangelize this evening. A lot of those people were lost people. 
You're trying to bring them in to Christ. But here, these are people who are already in the church. Who are already in fellowship with other believers. Or with believers. And yet, they wonder. Now this, this makes us ask a question. At least it does me when I read this. He says here, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, well, is that person who wanders from the truth a true Christian or not? Are they a true Christian or not? He goes on, verse 20, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner... So now, notice how he changes. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings it back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner, now he calls him a sinner, from his wandering will save his soul from death. Will save his soul from death. So then we think, okay, wait a minute. James, if you're saying that by us bringing him back, we save his soul from death, and if death there means hell, then was he ever really a true Christian or not? Is he saved? Is he not? Is that person who wanders saved or not? Well, this is what I think is happening here. What happens naturally in the church when someone wanders away? It's not like we're instantly declaring they're lost. You know what a phrase is we say a lot of times? Time will tell. Time will tell. That doesn't look good. They have committed adultery. They've been excommunicated from the church. They're not bearing fruits of a true Christian. But we don't know. Time will tell what's going to happen. So when he says here, if anyone among you wanders, you know, we don't know where this person is at. Clearly, verse 20 says, if in the end we're saving his soul from death, we, we can't be saying, well, they're for certain a Christian, or we can't say for certain they're lost. And so this makes me think of the truth that the Bible talks about Christians having to endure to the end. Who knows where a verse is that talks about enduring to the end? Well, 10.22. Maybe it is in 22 as well. But it says, those who endure to the end will be saved. The Christian life is one of enduring to the end. You know, why does he switch and call them sinners in verse 20? Who brings back a sinner. And again, if you know your Bibles, the Christian is not called a sinner in the New Testament. The Bible does not, the, Paul doesn't write and say to the sinners at Ephesus. He writes and says to the saints at Ephesus, to those who are set apart. And so when it says here, sinner, why is he saying that? I think that, that, that that's teaching us that no matter their verbal profession, the practice of their life in the present, is what we're going to look at. Meaning, here guys, he says he's a Christian and he's living in sin. All accounts point that he is living in sin. That he is a sinner. That he's an unbeliever. So I, I think that's kind of the idea there. Turn to 1 John 2 real quick. 1 John 2. This is a verse that is so important to remember. He's talking here about those who are anti-Christ. They're opposed to Jesus Christ of the Bible. And look what he says here. And, and that means any unbeliever. Look what he says here in verse 19. This really helps us when we see people go out from us. Verse 19, 1 John 2. They went out from us. Why, John? But they were not of us. Explain to us, John. For if they had been of us, what would have happened, John? They would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain or obvious that they all are not of us. You see that? That, that is an important verse. So I think what's happening here, this is, this is what's happening in James 5. Here a person is a wonder. We don't know if they're really saved. We don't know if they're really lost. We do know, guess what? We're called to bring them back. We're called to reach out to them. If they come back, that's going to be proof they're a Christian. Or they'll get saved truly when they come back if they were lost. If they don't come back, what's 1 John 2.19 say? If they wonder, 
If they're led astray, if they're misled, and they never come back, what does 1 John 2.19 say? They were never of us. They could not have been true Christians. This is important when we think of this. Because again, if, if, if I'm reading this and he says, if anyone from among you wanders from the truth, it's very easy to get discouraged when you see people wander from the truth. It's very easy to feel frustrated when I look and I have a list of people that I've known who've wandered from the truth years ago. Why not get discouraged? Well, if they don't come back, it's proof they were not saved to begin. Luke 8, it says this, and the ones on the rock are those, so seeds were sown on a rock, when they hear the Word, They receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. That's Luke 8, 13. A time of testing. You know one of the biggest times of testing a believer has is when they are being deceived and they're being led astray by lies of the devil, and they start to wonder. That's a big test. Are they going to come back? Are they going to endure? Or are they going to fall away? And he says here, during a time of testing, these people fall away. Okay, let's look at the text again. James 5, 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders, let's think of that next phrase, wonders from the truth. They wonder from the truth. It doesn't say they wonder from the truth. The, the building. You see, it doesn't say they wonder... I was about to call this a church, but this is not a church. This is a chapel, uh, a building where the church meets. We are the church, the members of the body. A church is not a building. We know that. But it doesn't say here they wandered from the building. It doesn't even say here initially they wander from the fellowship of believers. Think, when someone starts to wonder, it's not like it all of a sudden, they're poof, gone. Things are already happening in their heart. Things are already happening in their mind that lead them eventually to completely separate from a church and not go to another solid church. So it doesn't say here, you know, when you read wonders from the truth, we're going to look at what the truth is in a minute, but it doesn't mean they left a church right away or anything like that. So what is the truth? He says here, my brothers, that's us, if we're a Christian, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. What is the truth? What is the truth? Can you think of any man who said that he is the truth? Yeah, Jesus. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. The life. No one comes to God the Father but through me. So clearly, when we think of truth, we're going to think of it in two levels. The ultimate level of truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the truth. It's not, you know, just certain truths, but it all comes together in the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, He is God in the flesh, the Son of God, and He is truth. So ultimately, it's Christ. Now, second, secondly is what? They've wandered from the truth. You think of more subtle truths. Uh, look at James 3.14, for example. James 3.14. When you think of the truth, yes, ultimately it's Jesus Christ, but there's other things at a, at a smaller level that ultimately lead to a denying of Jesus Christ. Again, you deny small truths first that lead you to deny Christ. Uh, where did I put us? James ah, 3.14. Here he says this, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, look what he says, do not boast and be false truth. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are false to the truth. So to wander from the truth in a smaller sense could mean a person wanders into bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. If I go this week 
into bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, that is me wandering from the truth. I am, I am going, and as he says right here, <clears throat> uh, false to the truth. These things are false to the truth. And if someone doesn't bring me back, if I don't get brought back through reading the Word or brought back through a sermon, that's only going to start to snowball. You let bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in, it snowballs. Look what he says, well, look what he says next, what it snowballs into. For, or he goes on, verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, so it's not the wisdom of Christ from above, but is earthly and spiritual demonic. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So if I wonder in my heart, notice where that took place? Internally. Internally in my heart. If I wonder in my heart to selfish ambition and to jealousy, I'm wandering from the truth. And that could lead me to vile practices. And so when, I, when, when we read this and he says, my brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth, you don't just think, hey, that brother's denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's go bring him back. No. You look and say, hey, that brother has selfish ambition and jealousy in his life. Let's go bring him back. Let's go show that brother, look, that heart attitude you've got is opposed to the truth. And we bring him back. Now turn to 2 Corinthians 11. So truth, the, the truth in James 5 ultimately, yes, is Christ. John 14, 6, he says he is the truth. But on a deeper level, it's such things as selfish ambition, jealousy, etc. And as in James said, it happens in the heart. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3, Paul says, I'm afraid, but I am afraid. What are you afraid of, Paul? That as the serpent, that's the devil, deceived Eve back in the garden, she ate the fruit, by his cunning, what are you afraid of, Paul? That your thoughts, notice where it happens? Thoughts will be led astray. That's what we have in James 5. That word, wandered, led astray. From. Now notice what Paul is afraid our thoughts will be led astray from. From a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. But I'm afraid that if the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So, when we think about people wandering from the truth, we've got to ask ourselves, how does this happen? What's going on behind the scenes to get them to wander away from the truth? And I think this verse gives us a lot of light on it. First, it shows us who's going after us. The devil. What do we find in 1 Peter 5? He is our adversary. He is a, he is a lion prowling around and you're walking through that field and He's waiting to prounce on you. Not physically kill you. He's waiting to prounce on you with slanders. He's going to tell you lies that are not consistent with the truth. What do we find? What's He going after? He's going after your thoughts. What does He want to happen to your thoughts? He wants them to be led astray. Led astray from what? From eschatology? No. From a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Look, the greatest thing the devil wants is our minds to be off of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be led astray from thinking about Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. If Jesus Christ is the truth, and I'm not thinking of Christ, my thoughts are led astray to something else. What's the opposite of truth? Falsehood. Lies. You got someone speaking truth, you got someone speaking lies. Well, if my mind and my thoughts are led astray from Christ, then what automatically is my mind thinking about? Falsehood. Lies. 
things not concerning Jesus Christ. What are some things not according to Christ? I mean, think, think, think of these things. Here one we've seen in this church. Someone rejected the truth of what? Submission to husbands. And that led them to wander away from the truth. We've had to discipline someone from the church because a refusal to follow the truth that we find in Ephesians 5 about submitting to husbands. Okay? They've wandered away from the truth in that area. Meaning, when I see someone in something like unwillingness to submit, not understanding what God's revealed about our roles, I'm called to bring them back to the truth of the Word of God. Here another is. Rejecting the truth that homosexuality is a sin is leading some to wander from the truth. Any church that will start to say homosexuality is okay, they're, they're, not just are they wandering from the truth right there in that statement, they've, pro- they've already been wandering in a whole lot of other areas. We find this in Timothy. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Sound teaching is that wives are to submit to the husbands. That husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Sound teaching is 1 Corinthians 6.9 Do not be deceived. The homosexual will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. The time is coming when people will not endure that. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3-4. They'll wander off into myths. Now notice, it, it, says, it says right there, they will turn away from listening to the truth. It doesn't say they'll turn away from listening to preachers. They just turn away from listening to the truth. They start watering it down a little bit. So again, when we think of someone as wandering away from the truth, it doesn't mean they're way out there. You, you wander slowly. When I'm on the narrow road and I, I get deceived by the devil and I follow a sign down a side road, I don't get a mile down that side road in a moment. It takes some time. You get deeper and deeper away from the truth. And we're called to bring them back. 1 Timothy 1. Go ahead and turn there real quick. 1 Timothy 1. 1. We're going to look at verse 5 through 7. By rejecting the charge of what character should be true in the believer's life, some have wandered away. 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. The aim of our charge is love. What type of love, Paul? That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, what are these? Genuine love, a good conscience. How do you get a good conscience? Your conscience is informed by the Word of God. I can't in a good conscience say to you, homosexuality is okay because my conscience is informed by the Word of God. But here, by swerving from a good conscience, sincere faith, they have a hypocritical faith, and swerving from genuine love, it says they have wandered away. That same idea. Wandered away into vain discussion. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Notice the end of that verse. The things they make confident assertions. I mean, you just you turn on the news and you find people making confident assertions. You find Matthew Vines, a very big homosexual advocate, making confident assertions that it's okay. That he has already swerved from genuine love. They, they're doing it in the name of love, but it's not genuine love. He swerved from a good conscience. His conscience is not informed from the Word of God, and he doesn't have a sincere faith. So, what are we looking at? We've looked at what the truth is. It's ultimately Christ. Yet, 
you deny other truths, you wander from other truths, it leads you to deny Christ ultimately. One last smaller thing to look at, 1 Timothy 6. Here, here one is. <clears throat> Rejecting the warning to not crave after money is wandering from the truth. What, what is the truth in 1 Timothy 6.10? It's this. For the love of money is a, it's one, it's not the only, it's a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, the love of money, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So, let's go back to James. And think about this now. In light of these things, <clears throat> James 5, So my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth that selfish ambition and jealousy are demonic wisdom, or if they wander into that because it is demonic wisdom, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money is a craving that's led many people to perish, if anyone among you wanders from those truths and many more, and someone brings him back, and someone brings him back, and someone brings him back. Let's think about that for a moment. Brings him back. How do we bring back a wanderer? I mean, it's as simple as I can put it. What did they get? What did they wander away from? Truth. So how do you bring back a wanderer? You go to him and you simply, I mean, this is very practical. You, you talk to him and you're trying to figure out what specific truths has he wandered away from? What lies is he believing? What thoughts in his mind have been led astray from a simple devotion to Christ? I mean, very practical. You talk to him and you start to figure out those things. You ask him questions. And you start to hear him say something like, well, yeah, love of money isn't that bad. And what do you do? If he's wandered from the truth, you find out where he's wandered and then you give him truth. I mean, it can't be, it's not simpler. It's, you can't get it simpler than that. To bring someone who's wandered from the truth back, you have to give them truth. It's their ultimate determination if they're going to reject that truth or not. I mean, we've got many uh, false churches, false prophets who like Balaam are leading people astray. And you can go to them, they're wandering from the truth, and you can give them truth. They might reject that. Most times they will reject that. So, I mean, as far as how do we bring back a wanderer? Um, I mean, I think it's that simple. Uh, you know, even me. Uh, when I was first saved, I started to wander. Now, that doesn't mean I missed a meeting. I didn't miss a meeting in the church. Again, wandering doesn't start there. Things are going on in here. Things are going on in the mind. And I started to wander from the truth. I, I had idols in my heart. I had bitterness in my heart. I had unforgiveness in my heart. And um, a guy had just moved into the Grace House. And I knew he wasn't a Christian. And there was a conference that day at Community Baptist outside of town. And I just thought, I don't want this guy to perish. I'm going to take him to the conference. I didn't want to go to the conference. I wanted to isolate myself. I wanted to lick my wounds. I didn't want to go to the conference. But this guy just moved into Grace House that day. I thought, I don't want him to go to hell. <laughs> I mean, here I am a hypocrite at that moment. And so I hopped in my car. I took him to, that, to the meeting. And Don Johnson was preaching. Now here I am, I'm wandering away from the truth. Things were not right in my mind. And Don Johnson, just like that time I mentioned last week where Mac Tomlinson got up and in a way prophesied to me, Don Johnson did the same thing. I mean, it was like he was reading my thoughts. I went up to him after the sermon and I said, why did you preach on all of that? And he just, well, I, I, the Lord led me to do it. And here I had bitterness, unforgiveness. That's wandering from the truth. The truth is I must forgive. The truth is if I don't forgive, I will not be forgiven before my Father who's in heaven. 
So by not forgiving, I'm wandering from the truth. Yeah, I didn't deny Christ yet. But if I kept on that path, Jesus says, that leads to hell. And Don Johnson from the pulpit, I don't remember the words, there's a clip on I'll Be Honest called You Must Overcome. And that clip was from that sermon. And that two minutes, that clip was what punched me in the heart. But he said, there's people who've offended you and hurt you and you've got to get over it. And when he said you've got to get over it, I mean, that he, he from the pulpit was bringing someone who was wandering away from the truth, he was bringing me back. He was bringing me back that night. And that, I mean, God really restored me that night and stripped me bare of my sin, my pride. You know, I thought of this song we've sing, sung before. It says, bring them in, bring them in. I think they first sang that in India. I don't know if we've maybe seen it once or twice. <clears throat> but how do we bring back the wanderer? Well, the song, I like how the song says it, and it's consistent with the Bible. The song is not from the Bible, it's the flavor of the scriptures. It says this bring them in. Now, we're not bringing them in, we're bringing them back. So I'm going to change that word. Bring them back, bring them back, bring them back from the fields of sin. Bring them back, bring them back, bring the wandering ones. To what? If they wandered from the truth, and to bring them back, I got to give them truth. And the ultimate truth is who? John fourteen six, Christ. And so the song rightly says, "Bring the wandering ones to Jesus." I mean, here someone is wandering from the truth. You bring them to Jesus Christ. And I don't remember all that Don Curran, or Don Johnson preached on that night, but I'm sure he mentioned things about Jesus Christ that convicted me that my sin is ridiculous. Look at the love of Christ for me. How on earth can I not forgive? So how do we bring back a wanderer? I mean, James says, he says right here, brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone brings him back. Now, he doesn't say here how they bring him back. But we find that in other places in the Scriptures. And we can assume if they wander from the truth, we bring them back with the truth. And the ultimate truth is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. So, a couple, you know, I mean, Peter wandered from the truth in Galatians. Paul said this I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Peter was not conducting himself in a way of the truth of the gospel. He's wondering, what did Paul do? I said to Peter before them all, and he gave his reason. If you, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We don't have to get into all that, but in simple, Paul was correcting Peter's wrong thinking. Paul saw, Peter, you shrunk back. That was hypocritical. It's okay for you to be eaten with the Gentiles. And Paul comes in there and corrects wrong thinking because Satan tries to lead us astray in our thoughts from the truth. Turn to Luke 22. Here, here is another glorious example. Here is an example of someone bringing someone back who wandered from the truth. Luke 22, 31. Remember, Paul said, I'm afraid the devil is going to try to lead you astray in your thoughts. Here Jesus says this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, so there we see the devil again, demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And here Christ is bringing a wanderer back. Remember, Peter is going to deny Christ. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, when you turn from your wandering, strengthen your brothers. I mean, you want a practical way to bring back a wanderer? Pray for them. Like I said, there's guys who are wandering. I've tried to reach out to them to bring them back. They won't hear my calls. And what other options do I have? Prayer. And that's not just the last, that's not the last option. That's a very good option. Christ prayed and Peter's faith failed not. That's how powerful the Lord Jesus' prayer is there. And again, what an encouragement. Christ is praying for me that my faith may not fail. Someone says, I'm afraid my faith is going to fail. 
Well, the only way it will fail is if Christ fails to pray for you, and He will never fail to do that. He can't, because He's perfect. He's God in the flesh. I, I may go and try to pray in the morning and fall asleep. Christ prayed perfectly. He never failed to pray. What a hope we have there. Charles Leiter did a series on Luke 22 called um, An In-Depth Look at Peter's Stumblings. It's incredibly encouraging, all the insights he pulled out from that chapter. So, those are a couple examples. Here, here some other thoughts are. Here he says here, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone brings them back. Here's something else as you see people wander from. I mean, the, the truth, they may wander in so many ways, but here one is, people wander from the truth that we're saved by the work of Christ alone. And what do they wander into? They wander into a work salvation. Now I can't tell you how many times I had to bring someone back to the truth that the only thing that will save them is Christ. I mean, you get talking to them, and they're just starting to talk about their works, what they're going to do, and it's like you have totally wandered from the truth. You've been deceived. You've been led astray in a self-righteous attitude, and I'm bringing them back to Christ. Some wander away by idolizing their feelings. They're putting their hope in their feelings. Do I have the right feeling? And we need to bring them back to the truth, which is Christ. He saves alone. It's not a feeling. It's the blood of Christ. Now let's look at verse 20. Let him know. Him is who? The someone who brings the person back who's wandering. You guys follow that? My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him, that's the someone who brings the wanderer back, let him know. So there's something we need to know. Because most of us, we're in the situation where we're bringing people back who are wandering from the truth. And James says, let him know. He's writing this. He wants people to know something because that will affect them. Let him know, and he says this, two things. That whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will, one, save his soul from death. Two, will cover a multitude of sins. Now we need to understand what that means. Because James is saying, let this person who's getting these wonders back know some truth. Because by knowing these, what those two things are, that will make us all the more want to bring the wanderers back. What will motivate us? Knowing these two things. So let's think about the first. Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. I mean... We, we got to think, what does that mean? One question comes to the mind. Does this refer to, as someone else said, deliverance of the erring Christian from premature physical death? Is this referring to them being delivered by us getting them back from a premature physical death? Meaning they're a true Christian, but their sin, God's going to put them on the shelf, take them to glory early. He's going to Bring them out. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it refers to that. Will save his soul from death. I think the death there is referring will save his soul from eternal punishment, from hell. Now, here one reason is why. Look what he says in the very next statement. And will cover a multitude of sins. How does anyone get to heaven? I mean, it's right there. Do you know why I'm going to heaven? you know why if I die tonight in a car wreck on the way home, I'm going to heaven? Because my sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now James says here, read this again. If he brings back a sinner from his wandering, he'll save his soul from death. And, so something else is going to happen here too will cover a multitude of sins. So this is the thing. That implies if they don't come back from their wandering, then a multitude of sins are not covered. They stay dead in their sins. Now let me, I don't feel like that hit home. Let's, let me think for a second. 
What, what did I write here? Maybe my next phrase says, will cover a multitude of sins. That implies if they don't return, their sins aren't covered, and a person whose sins aren't covered doesn't just physically die, but is eternally damned. Now, let me try to get this next thing across. So what... Okay, one second. Okay, so what does it mean save his soul from death? Can I save someone from hell? Can I pay for your sins? Absolutely not. But, I can be an instrument to bring you to the truth, and the truth of Christ is where you find cleansing from your sins. We find this idea, 1 Timothy 4, keep a close watch on yourselves and on the teaching. Why? Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Wait, Paul, I'm going to save my hearers? I'm, going to save, I'm not going to save in the sense of pay for your sins. But I'm going to be involved as an instrument of helping you get to the end by giving you truth. And it's those who hold on to the truth and the hope of Christ that are going to make it to the end. That are going to endure. Again, the Christian life is a race. So Christ alone saves, but we persist in pointing people to Christ and are used as an instrument that gets them to the end. Now, let's think of this second phrase. Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will cover a multitude of sins. Now, the first thing that came to my mind here was 1 Peter 4.8. Who knows what that says? It's got that same phrase. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Okay, love covers a multitude of sins. The text says here that you will cover a multitude of sins if you bring the wanderer back. Is it the same thing though? Clearly in 1 Peter, it's talking about you sin against me and I cover that. I, you know what? I forgive you. I don't bring it up. I don't make an issue of that. I do not think that that at all could be what verse 20 is referring to. I mean, how on earth could we read this and think, you'll save his soul from hell and will cover a multitude of sins? It can't mean what 1 Peter 4.8 says. So what does it refer to? For a while, I'd read this text and this is what I would think. We'll cover a multitude of sins and I would think, okay, by me bringing the wanderer back, I'm helping prevent him from doing more sin. And so I'm covering a multitude of sins in the future that he was going to go and commit. Does that make sense? That was one way I used to take it. That's how I would take it. I don't think it means that though. I don't think it means preventing future sin from happening. So this is the question that helped me figure out what this is referring to. We'll cover a multitude of sins. Ask this. What does a person need for his soul to be saved from death? Now why would we ask that question? Because he just mentioned that. He just mentions, we'll save his soul from death. Okay, how? What do I need for my soul to be saved from death? I need my sins covered. So I think all James is saying here, he's, you can just read it like this. Let him know whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. And why is his soul saved from death? Because he's been brought from lies and falsehood to the truth, and the truth of Christ is that the blood of Christ covers our sins. And when he says, we'll cover a multitude of sins, that's because he's brought the man to the truth. And the, the core of the truth of the Gospel is Christ covers our sins. I think it's similar to the idea in 1 John. Tim preached on this. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sins. It makes it sound you know, conditionally. If I'm walking in the light, I'm cleansed. If I'm not walking in the light, I'm not cleansed. What's the point of that? Am I not once and for all declared righteous? Have not all my sins been removed as far as the east is from the west? Again, I think it's the reality that we don't know where the person's at. And when, they, when I bring that wanderer back, there's the great comfort, not just that their soul is saved from hell, but the great comfort that all the sins they committed when they wandered have been covered. All of those sins 
of idolatry, self-pity, bitterness, unforgiveness that I had in my heart when I wandered as a new Christian, that's all been covered. Not just did Don Johnson bring me back by giving me the truth that without him knowing it, but all of my sins were covered. I think that's what it means. As David said after his sin, he said, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Something in the present is going on. So, if you get back in the light, there is indeed is cleansing from all sin. Yet if you stay in the darkness, it proves you're lost. I mean, does that make anyone uncomfortable? That's how the Bible talks. If a guy wanders from the truth and he doesn't come back and he stays in his sin, he's proving. 1 John 2.19 says he's proven. He never really knew the Lord. You know, people talk, all these young people, they get 18 and they go to college and they leave the church and they go and live in their sin. And everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Why do all these people go to college and they don't stay Christians? Well, here the answer is. Because they were never Christians to begin. They were never born again. The reason they turned 18, could do whatever they want, and went and did sin is because that's what they always wanted to do. They were just sheltered from doing it because they lived in a house with their parents and they didn't want to get kicked out because they had a, wanted to have a roof over their head. So we've got four minutes. So how should this motivate us to be rescuers of wanderers? How should this, meaning verse 20, let him know, do I know this? Do you guys know this? That whoever, that I want that to be us, let you know that when you bring back a sinner from his wandering from the truth and you bring him back to the truth, you are going to save his soul from death. That means he, even, he maybe just got converted. Or he was already saved and you brought him back and he's going to continue to endure and prove to be saved. Let him know you save his soul from death and his sins have been covered. I mean, it, think of, there is a comfort in knowing even if I wreck my car, it's already covered for. i got the best insurance I can. But having that type of insurance doesn't make you want to drive reckless because you don't want to take it for granted. And again, that's Paul's whole argument in Romans 6. Because of the great insurance we have that all our sins are covered, we're going to be the most careful people to make sure we don't burn down our house. Even if I burn down my house, it's completely covered. That's great. That doesn't mean I put a BBQ pit in the living room and do that. I'm careful because my sins have been covered. So, that should motivate us. I mean, think of it. I can go to one of these people who's wandering from the truth and I can say, guess what? If you come back to the truth, all of your sins are covered. I think that's what verse 20 is talking about. All the sins are covered. You know, this, this shows me here it's not a hopeless endeavor to go, go to try to bring people back. Don't think it's a hopeless endeavor. Another thing this should give is great joy to see people come back who've wondered. And we should see it happen. Uh, you know, in Luke, what did, what did Jesus say? There's more joy in heaven over one sinner. And that's exactly what James calls them here. Bring back a sinner. One sinner who repents, the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And when he has found it, or goes on, he says, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So we should, look, we should be motivated to want to bring people back because there's going to be a whole lot of joy. I mean, just the thought of some of the people who've wandered from the truth coming back, that would be so joyful to see them come back. And to know all their sins are covered. So here a couple conclusions are. We've got one minute. Conclusion one. Do you think you're going astray? I mean, right now, do any of you think, you know what, I wonder if I'm going astray. I wonder if I'm wandering from the truth. I would say pray like Job. Job says this in 6.24, Teach me, and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone astray. That's some humility. Lord, how have I gone astray? Be open for correction. Go to the Lord in prayer. I mean, that's what Job's doing. He's praying. 
Make me understand it. I don't understand, Lord, how I've gone astray. I feel like I'm going astray. Make me understand it. Another conclusion. Are you already astray? Are you already astray? Isaiah 53, 6 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned. Everyone to his own way. That, that's a good summary of what it means to wander from the truth. You go from the truth of Christ to your own way. The woman who doesn't want to submit to the husband, that's her own way. The person who wants to say homosexuality is not sin, that's their own way. So ultimately, any wandering of the truth is a selfish desire for my own way. But look what he says here. We've all turned aside. We've all went astray to His own way. And look what happened. The Lord has laid on Christ, on Him, the sin of us all. Isn't that amazing? The Gospel of Jesus Christ, even though we've all gone astray, we've all went our own way, here God the Father comes and He takes our sin and He lays it on the head of Jesus Christ. And then He slaughters Christ in our place to answer for the slaughtering that we deserve. That's what Luke 19.27 says. Bring those before Me who refuse to let Me reign over them and slaughter them before Me. The only reason I will not be slaughtered by the wrath of God on Judgment Day is because Christ was slaughtered in My place as a substitute. So if you are astray, you have one hope and that's in Jesus Christ. You have turned away to your own way. You need to acknowledge it and believe that God's laid your sins on Christ and He's been crushed and paid for them in your place. So lastly, the point of the whole text is two believers. And, and let's read it again. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders, so we need to watch, is anyone wondering from the truth? They may still be in our midst, but they're wondering from the truth in their mind. It's being led astray by the devil to lies. And someone brings him back let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So with that said, we need to bring them back. I'm going to close with a quote. This is a quote on my wall. Uh, I, it was in the, the book. Uh, Tim Lorman gave me the book uh, Reformed Pastor by Richard Baxter. I have not read the whole thing, but this quote stuck out to me so much I made a picture and put it on my wall. He says this, Wait not till their strength, that's the sheep, and understanding are gone. So don't wait till their strength and understanding are gone. And time so short that you scarcely know what to do. But go to them as soon as you hear they are sick, whether they sin for you or not. And that's the attitude we've got to have. Not just, not just the pastors in the church, my brothers and sisters, you want to bring them back. When you hear they're wandering from the truth, when you talk to them and you hear something come out of their mouth and you think, wait a minute, that's not consistent with the truth of the Word of God. You want to bring them back to the Word of God. You want to give them truth and you want to see them restored. Because ultimately, any heir... It, you don't just stop with one air usually. It snowballs. And as he says here, it leads to death, to hell. Well, let's... Does anyone have any questions? What was the last reference? Oh, the Isaiah? Isaiah 53.6, All we like sheep have gone astray. Oh, Luke 19.27. And it's a parable, but it's pointing to the judgment. It says, bring those before Me who refuse to let Me reign over them. And that's just like Isaiah 53. Everyone is turned to his own way. They're turning saying, I don't want the Lord Jesus to reign over Me. You know, that is a scary thing. I mean, I did that 21 years of my life. And even as a Christian, I've done that. And thank God, I was brought from wandering and 
A multitude of sins were covered. The precious blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That is really good news. When you wander. We don't have to worry. The person who's wandering, we don't have to worry. Are they saved? Are they not? Just bring them back to the truth. And that will be the true test of the genuineness of their faith anyways. That's why I don't even think he deals with that here. He goes and says, they're among you, and then he calls them a sinner. He, James doesn't even feel like he's got to be say, yeah, they're lost. Time will tell. Remember, we've got to endure to the end. Yet God's going to keep us to the end. He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The reason I'm going to make it to the end is because God began a good work. Well, let's pray. Father, please help us to bring people back who've wandered away from the truth. Lord, give us wisdom like the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us grace to pray like Him like He did for Peter. Lord, please help us. We need Your grace. Oh God, please give us grace. In Jesus' name, Amen.